The greatest discovery in the history of science is that there was a day without a yesterday. The universe has not existed forever. It was born. All matter, energy, space, and even time burst into being in a titanic fireball we call the Big Bang 13.82 billion years ago. The fireball expanded and out of the cooling debris there congealed the galaxies, great islands of stars, two trillion of them, of which our Milky Way is but one. But whatever way you look at it, the idea of the universe popping into existence like a rabbit out of a hat is bonkers. For this reason, scientists like Brian Greene had to be dragged kicking and screaming to it. The last thing they wanted to answer was the awkward question, what happened before the Big Bang? We don't fully understand how the universe began, which is often how people think about the Big Bang. That's a theory of how the universe began. It's not. It's a theory of how the universe evolved, assuming it already came into existence. Obviously, the more we learn about the universe, the more questions arise. These puzzles perhaps are not as unrelated as they might seem, but are instead collectively pointing us towards a very different picture of our universe and its earliest moments. In that new picture, the Big Bang can no longer be described as the very beginning of the universe that we know, and the hot Big Bang almost certainly does not equate to the birth of space and time. That begs the question, if the Big Bang wasn't truly the beginning, what was it? Join us as we uncover the idea that the Big Bang isn't the beginning of the universe and how the Big Bang theory is actually wrong. Like most stories in science, the origin of the Big Bang has its roots in both theoretical and experimental observational realms. On the theory side, Einstein put forth his general theory of relativity in 1915, a novel theory of gravity that sought to overthrow Newton's theory of universal gravitation. And although Einstein's theory was a far more intricate and complicated theory, it wasn't long before the first exact solutions were found. In 1916, Carl Schwarzschild found the solution for a point-like mass, which he describes a non-rotating black hole. In 1917, Willem de Sitter found the solution for an empty universe with a cosmological constant, which describes an exponentially expanding universe. From 1916 to 1921, the Reisner-Nordstrom solution, found independently by four researchers, described the space-time for a charged, spherically symmetric mass. In 1921, Edward Kasner found a solution that described a matter and radiation-free universe that's anisotrophic, or different in different directions. And in 1922, Alexander Friedman discovered the solution for isotropic, or same in all directions, and homogeneous, same at all locations, universe, where any and all types of energy, including matter and radiation, were present. That last one was very compelling for two reasons. One is that it appeared to describe our universe on the largest scales, where things appear similar, on average, everywhere and in all directions. And two, if you solve the governing equations for the solution, the Friedman equations, you'd find that the universe it describes cannot be static, but must either expand or contract. This latter fact was recognized by many, including Einstein, but it wasn't taken particularly serious until the observational evidence began to support it. In the 1910s, astronomer Vesto Slipher started observing certain nebulae, which some argued might be galaxies outside of our Milky Way, and found that they were moving fast, far faster than any objects within our galaxy. Moreover, the majority of them were moving away from us with fainter, smaller nebulae generally appearing to move faster. Then, in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble began measuring individual stars in these nebulae and eventually determined the distances to them. Not only were they much farther away than anything else in our galaxy, but the ones at the greater distances were moving away faster than the closer ones. 
as Lamatre and Robertson, Hubble, and others swiftly put together, the universe was expanding. Georges Lamatre was the first in 1927 to recognize this. Upon discovering the expansion, he extrapolated backward theorizing, as any competent mathematician might, that you could go as far back as you wanted to what he called the primeval atom. In the beginning, he realized the universe was a hot, dense, and rapidly expanding collection of matter and radiation, and everything around us emerged from this primordial state. This idea was later developed by others to make a set of additional predictions. Number one, the universe as we see it today is more evolved than it was in the past. The farther back we look in space, the farther back we're also looking in time. So the objects we see back then should be younger, less gravitationally clumpy, less massive, with fewer heavy elements and with less evolved structure. There should even be a point beyond which no stars or galaxies were present. Number two, at some point the radiation was so hot that neutral atoms couldn't stably form because radiation would reliably kick any electrons off the nuclei they were attempting to bind to. And so there should be a leftover bath, now cold and sparse, of cosmic radiation from this time. And three, at some extremely early time, it would have been so hot that even atomic nuclei would be blasted apart, implying there was an early, pre-stellar phase where nuclear fusion would have occurred, a Big Bang nucleosynthesis. From that, we expect there to have been at least a population of light elements and their isotopes spread throughout the universe before any stars were formed. In conjunction with the expanding universe, these points would become the cornerstone of the Big Bang Theory. The growth and evolution of the large-scale structure of the universe, of individual galaxies, and of the stellar populations found within those galaxies all validates the Big Bang's predictions. The discovery of a bath of radiation just 3K above absolute zero, combined with its black body spectrum and temperature imperfections at microkelvin levels of tens to hundreds, was the key evidence that validated the Big Bang and eliminated many of its most popular alternatives. And the discovery and measurement of the light elements and their ratios, including hydrogen, deuterium, helium minus three, helium minus four, and lithium minus seven, revealed not only which type of nuclear fusion occurred prior to the formation of stars, but also the total amount of normal matter that existed in the universe. Extrapolating back to as far as your evidence can take you is a tremendous success for science. The physics that took place during the earliest stages of the hot Big Bang imprinted itself onto the universe, enabling us to test our models, theories, and understanding of the universe from that time. The earliest observable imprint, in fact, is the cosmic neutrino background, which effects show up in both the cosmic microwave background, the Big Bang's leftover radiation, and the universe's large-scale structure. This neutrino background comes to us, remarkably, from just less than one second into the hot Big Bang. But extrapolating beyond the limits of your measurable evidence is a dangerous, albeit tempting, game to play. After all, if we can trace the hot Big Bang back some 13.8 billion years ago, all the way to when the universe was less than one second old, What's the harm in going all the way back just one additional second to the singularity predicted to exist when the universe was zero seconds old? The answer, surprisingly, is that there's a tremendous amount of harm. If you're like me in considering making unfounded, incorrect assumptions about reality to be harmful, then the reason is problematic. It is because beginning at a singularity, at arbitrarily high temperatures, arbitrarily high densities, and arbitrarily small volumes will have consequences for our universe that aren't necessarily supported by observations. For example, if the universe began from a singularity, then it must have sprung into existence with exactly the right balance of stuff in it, matter and energy combined, to precisely balance the expansion rate. 
If there were just a tiny bit more matter, the initially expanding universe would have already re-collapsed by now. And if there were a tiny bit less, things would have expanded so quickly that the universe would be much larger than it is today. And yet, instead, what we're observing is that the universe's initial expansion rate and the total amount of matter and energy within it balance as perfectly as we can measure. Why? Well, if the Big Bang began from a singularity, we have no explanation. We simply have it to assert the universe was born this way, or as physicists ignorant of Lady Gaga call it, initial conditions. Similarly, a universe that reached arbitrarily high temperatures would be expected to possess leftover high energy relics, like magnetic monopoles, but we don't observe any. The universe would also be expected to be different temperatures in regions that are causally disconnected from one another, i.e. are in opposite directions in space and at our observational limits. And yet, the universe is observed to have equal temperatures everywhere to 99.99% plus precision. We're always free to appeal the initial conditions as the explanation for anything and say, well, the universe was born this way and that's that. But it would be much greater if we can come up with an explanation for the properties we observe. That's precisely what cosmic inflation gives us, plus more. Inflation says, sure, extrapolate the hot Big Bang back to a very early, very hot, very dense, very uniform state, but stop yourself before you go all the way back to a singularity. If you want the universe to have the expansion rate and the total amount of matter and energy in its balance, you'll need some way to set it up in that fashion. The same applies for a universe with the same temperatures everywhere. On a slightly different note, if you want to avoid high energy relics, you need some way to both get rid of any pre-existing ones and then avoid creating new ones by forbidding your universe from getting too hot once again. Inflation accomplishes this by postulating a period, prior to the hot Big Bang, where the universe was dominated by a large cosmological constant, or something that behaves similarly, the same solution found by De Sitter way back in 1917, this phase stretches the universe flat, gives it the same properties everywhere, gets rid of any pre-existing high-energy relics, and prevents us from generating new ones by capping the maximum temperature reached after inflation ends and the hot Big Bang ensues. Furthermore, by assuming there were quantum fluctuations generated and stretched across the universe during inflation, it makes new predictions for what types of imperfections the universe would begin with. Since it was hypothesized back in the 1980s, inflation has been tested in a variety of ways against the alternative, a universe that began from a singularity. When we stack up the scorecard, we find the following. Number one, inflation reproduces all of the successes of the hot Big Bang, there's nothing that the hot Big Bang accounts for that inflation can't also account for. Number two, inflation offers successful explanations for the puzzles that we simply have to say initial conditions for in the hot Big Bang. And number three, of the predictions where inflation and a hot Big Bang without inflation differ, four of them have been tested to sufficient precision to discriminate between the two. Of those four fronts, inflation is 4 for 4, while the hot Big Bang is 0 for 4. But things get really interesting if we look back at our idea of the beginning. Whereas a universe with matter and or radiation, what we get with a hot Big Bang, can always be extrapolated back to a singularity, any inflationary universe cannot. Due to its exponential nature, even if you run the clock back an infinite amount of time, space will only approach infinitesimal sizes and infinite temperatures and densities. It will never reach it. This means, rather than inevitably leading to a singularity, inflation absolutely cannot get you to one by itself. The idea that 
the universe began from a singularity, and that's what the Big Bang was, needed to be jettisoned the moment we recognized that an inflationary phase preceded the hot, dense, and matter and radiation-filled one we inhabit today. This new picture gives us three important pieces of information about the beginning of the universe that run counter to the traditional story that most of us learned. First, the original notion of the hot Big Bang, where the universe emerged from an infinitely hot, dense, and small singularity, and has been expanding and cooling, full of matter and radiation ever since, is incorrect. The picture is still largely correct, but there's a cutoff to how far back in time we can extrapolate it. Second, observations have well established the state that occurred prior to the hot Big Bang, cosmic inflation. Before the hot Big Bang, the universe underwent a phase of exponential growth, where any pre-existing components to the universe were literally inflated away. When inflation ended, the universe reheated to a high but not arbitrarily high temperature, giving us the hot, dense, and expanding universe that grew into what we inhabit today. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we can no longer speak with any sort of knowledge or confidence as to how or even whether the universe itself began. By the very nature of inflation, it wipes out any information that came before the final few moments, where it ended and gave rise to our hot Big Bang. Inflation could have gone on for an eternity. It could have been preceded by some other non-singular phase, or it could have been preceded by a phase that did emerge from a singularity. Until the day comes when we discover how to extract more information from the universe than presently seems possible, we have no choice but to face our ignorance. The Big Bang still happened a very long time ago, but it wasn't the beginning we once supposed it to be. But it is worth noting that even if the Big Bang may not be the entire story on its own, it is a vital part of the universal cosmic story that connects us all. And that's really appreciated. After all, like we said at the very beginning of this video, as humans learn more about the cosmos, we find that the more we know, the more questions seem to arise. Nevertheless, this is perhaps the beauty of the universe, the beauty of our cosmos. It is a perhaps infinite repository of knowledge, experiences, and questions. Whether our universe was birthed by a Big Bang or not, at this point, we cannot give a certain answer. Perhaps in the near future, when technology improves and we gain new knowledge, we will come across enough data to begin answering some of these important questions. Well, that's all the information we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit that bell so you never miss out on any future episodes. And be sure to tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.